Last week I talked about why it's futile to try to control everything and harmful to think someone should, along with why we shouldn't be afraid of the new and unknown, and how to open yourself up to new ideas and experiences. The week before that, I made a video on how people and societies benefit from a lack of external control. This week, and next week, I'm going to be doing my best to show you why things tend to work better without centralized control, when things in nature and people are free to do what they want. This video is about why planning something as complicated as an economy or a society is impossible and undesirable. Most political philosophy, or at least most in the mainstream, assumes the necessity of centralizing authority. Usually that means a state, but it all depends on the theory. It's assumed that certain duties need to be performed by a central authority. In liberal democracy, you're supposed to give them all this power, but somehow take a little bit of it away through elections. It's kind of a complicated theory. Leninists have got democratic centralism. But like all concentration of power, it's really just centralism. Political theorists and debates, and of course the media, ask questions like, what's the right healthcare policy? Or what's the right education policy? As if everyone's health would be efficiently managed by a state. Or one education policy could somehow suit millions of different students. Few of them ask what it would be like if there were no policy. Or there's Thomas Hobbes, who said about 400 years ago that due to immutable facts about our nature, we need a powerful, maybe all-powerful, central authority to keep us scared. Otherwise, society would break down. He was writing during the English Civil War when society had broken down, and he assumed all free societies would break down too. But he was wrong. And we know that for several reasons. First, like everyone else, Hobbes was writing for his time and place. There had been a central authority, a ruling party, the king and, its, and his cohorts. It faced a challenge to its power by another party, the parliamentarians, so it lost its monopoly on force. English people were not free and had not been free to live as they saw fit, but were accustomed to living under tyranny. What people do when state violence disappears varies a lot with the time and place in the individual. In all wars, though, for sure, you can find acts of compassion and kindness and cooperation and unity. The English Civil War probably wasn't, as Hobbes wrote, a war of all against all. It wasn't so much that civil society had broken down, since that's not really how wars start, but there was competition for which party would hold the power of the state. That's usually what a civil war is, aspiring states jockeying for power. Society was already broken, structured and ordered and directed by tyrants. Just like today. Hobbes was trying to make sweeping pronouncements about human nature based on his limited experience. And yet we still study and believe the stuff he wrote today. The modern argument from Hobbes is, without government, without police especially, everything would be chaos. Leninists and Maoists have their version of this argument, which is a, a free people could not possibly protect the revolution without capturing the state and using it against the reactionaries. It's still got that hint of Hobbes to it that ensures there's always a central power to prevent freedom from emerging. Many people think they know what's best for others, 
and they think they should be in charge. If only people did what I told them, then we'd solve problems. But it doesn't matter how competent you are. You'll never know more than the people whose problems you're attempting to solve. And that goes for people on the left who talk about scientific socialism, too. I'm kind of skeptical that there could ever be such a thing. Science is great for showing us what we don't know, how little we know, and how much work we have to do to find out. And that's great. It means we still need curiosity. We can still become fascinated by new discoveries. I'd much rather have that than pretend I know everything that's needed to be known. In our modern world, we're used to seeing scientific methods applied to just about everything. But not everything lends itself conveniently to science. Trying to analyze entire societies scientifically is hard to do, maybe impossible. Likewise, coming up with theories to explain all societies. They're too complex. Trying to analyze these things scientifically is bound to fail. You'll never have all the relevant information. And one reason we want to analyze these things, you know, scientifically, is we want to control them. We measure something, we number it, we label it, we put it in a jar, put it on a shelf so we can eventually learn to control it. We want to control everything from the weather to other people. But again, it's tough. These are complex systems we're talking about. People have tried, sure, to explain all of a person's behavior scientifically, but they never quite get things right. The ultimate test of facts <clears throat> is if you can make a prediction. How could you predict when someone was going to suddenly decide to take a walk or uh, pet their dog? And that's just one person. How could you predict traffic? How could you predict the stock market? Or which bird will fly in front of another in a flock? Not everything runs like a machine. But there are people trying to make these predictions, for sure. You can read their papers. My, politi my political economy professor once assigned me a paper with this extremely complicated formula for predicting when a civil war would break out. With pages and pages of variables and operations that no one was ever going to use. Fortunately, I only had to present on it and show everyone how silly it was. To get an idea of why these things are so hard for a minister or an agency or a bunch of philosopher kings, to run and plan and direct? Try this thought experiment. Imagine yourself walking through a crowded marketplace. Your eyes are constantly moving, left and right, up at moving and stationary objects, down at your feet, looking for obstacles, including moving ones, such as people. You're constantly taking in information offered by external stimuli making decisions as to which direction to go, how fast to go, when to turn, whether to stop, and so on. You make decisions based on local conditions, the conditions right around you, at every step. Now remember, everyone is making those decisions all the time. The aggregate of all of our decisions is society. We find order without needing to be coordinated by someone else. Now imagine there was a guy with a bullhorn standing on a table telling every one of us how to walk. You, where do you need to go? Okay, you go down that way. You, how about you? Okay, you go that way and turn left. You walk behind him, uh, you go the other way, uh, you do this, you do that, and if you bump into each other, wait where you are, and I'll go over there and resolve it for you. One would think, in the absence of an authority telling people how to move through the marketplace, 
all would be chaos. And if two people bumped into each other, they might end up killing each other. And yet, we'd only have order in a crowded place if there was no central organizer, no master planner, no one whose permission you need in order to do what you think is right. Now, obviously, the things people want the state to do are more difficult than navigating a public place. But in essence, they're not that different. One reason you can't plan a mass society, and notice I'm talking about society as we know it, not some small group of 20 people or something. But, but the problem with a, planning a mass society is you can never concentrate enough information in the minds of a small group of planners. Information is dispersed and incomplete. Our lives, and especially the institutions we run, rely on people with specific local knowledge working on the ground. The people in offices in other cities are largely superfluous. And yet they're the ones deciding on laws and regulations and budgets for the people doing the work. They make their decisions based on politics, which means in the service of the people who exert the most influence over that aspect of life. The ideal is the self-managed society, in which decisions don't depend on politics, but these local people with local knowledge, because they're the ones in the, the position to make the best use of that knowledge. They can plan, because they have the knowledge about a small part of the world within their influence, and they might need a plan to reach their goals. They make adjustments as needed based on immediate feedback like someone walking through a crowded place. That's why I would never go to your town and tell you what you need to do to solve your problems. I don't have the local knowledge you and your neighbors do. If you ask how something would get done without the state, I would ask if the people have ever had a chance to do it without politicians and bureaucrats in the driver's seat. If people at the Ministry of Whatever really believe in whatever, they won't mind working in the service of the institutions themselves, rather than for the state. They could even be some kind of leader, but only if the people working in the, those institutions agree. But if all they want is to give orders and feel superior, tell them to get a dog and leave the rest of us alone to do our jobs. It begs the question to say anything has to be monopolized by a class of people who have police and military forces at their command. Society does not need designing by experts and unquestioned central planners. As I said two weeks ago, there's nothing in our nature that dictates we have to live under someone else's thumb and no reason we can't have a free and equal society. What people need to consider is no center, no monopolies, no social hierarchy, everyone equally free to pursue what they want. And that's what I'll be talking about next week. See you then.